wonderful group here today. There was a, a time, perhaps in all of our lives, when we used to watch old black and white movies. And you remember the scene when a representative of the king would come before the citizens of the kingdom and they would gather in a square, some public place, and the representative of the king would unroll a scroll and he would begin by saying what? Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye by order of the king of the kingdom. And then he would read the decree or the pronouncement or the new law that was going to be given to the citizens of the kingdom. Because it came from the king, it had much more importance to it. When you come today to the book of James and you read what James says in James chapter 2, if you want to find that place in God's word, you almost hear James saying, as he speaks these words from God's word today, hear ye, hear ye, this is from the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hear his decree. It is the royal law of the king. It makes you want to listen more. What is this decree, this royal law of the king of kings and the Lord of lords? that is coming to us that our king looks for us to listen to and obey. It is the royal law of love. And you will find it in verse 8 of our passage today in James 2. Here is the royal law of of the king to the subjects of the kingdom, you and me. Verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. What is the royal law? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This royal law comes from the king and it is found as to be one of the oldest laws that we have from the king. Hold your place and look back to the book of Leviticus. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. The third book from the beginning, the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, beginning at verse 18. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Keep my decree. This old royal law came from the king, the Lord, and it is one of the oldest laws given. God is speaking to Moses. And he is telling Moses, this is one of the laws that my people are to live by in their new life under me. I am the Lord. Keep my decree. And then we come 
to the New Testament, and one day Jesus was asked a question. What is the greatest commandment of all? If you would look with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 12. Mark, chapter 12, beginning at verse 28. Mark, chapter 12, verse 28. Mark 12, 28. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Jesus answers, the most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, hear ye, hear ye, <laughs> O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Jesus, in being asked the question, which is the greatest commandment, answered, love God. Secondly, love other people. The summary of all the commandments that God has given in Jesus' mind is this. Love God and love others. Jesus believed in this royal law of love and encourages us to live by this royal law of love. Notice, if you would, that even Paul expresses this royal law of love. Look, if you would, at Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 8. Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 8. Eight. <clears throat> Paul writes, Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Paul says if you live by this royal law of love, we wouldn't need all these hundreds of other commandments because that law of love summarizes, fulfills all these other commandments given to us to live by. So live by, Paul says, this royal law of love. Now, to the book of James. James as we are preaching through James, has told us already that we are to not only be hearers of the word, but we are to be doers of the word. We've already heard James say that it is a faith that works that is the real faith. So rather than just talking about Love, he says, we need to show love. We need to do love. This royal law of love is to be applied to every area of our lives. Now, James centers in on one area of our life 
to apply this royal law to. It is in the area of prejudice. It is in the area of showing favoritism and partiality and looking down upon some people because of who they are or their status of life. So James comes to say, hear ye, hear ye, this royal law from the king of kings to all of us who are a part of the kingdom, apply the royal law of love in all of your relationships with other people. And then the Bible says, this royal law says that a Christian cannot be prejudiced. Look, if you would, at James chapter 2, verse 1. What he says right off. My brothers, my sisters, as believers in our glorious Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Brothers and sisters of the kingdom, the royal law of love says that as a Christian, we cannot be prejudiced, we cannot show favoritism, partiality, or look up or down at other people based on their status of life. And he says the Lord Jesus Christ is not prejudiced, and if we are followers of Jesus Christ, we will not be prejudiced either. And notice Jesus. Jesus certainly lived by the royal law of love. He treated all people the same. Whoever they were, whatever they were, wherever they were in life, Jesus treated people without partiality or prejudice or favoritism. Examples? When Jesus met the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, she was a sinful woman in the first place, living with a man who was not her husband even then, but she also was a Samaritan. And the Jews and the Samaritans did not jihaw well. That's not in the Bible, but <laughs> they did not get along. The Jews looked upon the Samaritans as half-breeds, saw them as lower than the low. Jesus encounters this sinful Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. And I want you to look with me at the Bible record of this in John's Gospel, chapter 4. John, chapter 4. In John's Gospel, chapter 4. In John 4, <clears throat> you'll find in verse 9 and 10 these words, John 4, 9. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. She is acknowledging the problem between the Jews and the Samaritans, the prejudice that exists between them. You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. John got that in there to be sure we understood the context of all of this. What did Jesus do? He answered, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. What happened? She took that living water and she was saved. 
How was it that she came about to be saved? Because Jesus did not have a prejudice in his heart toward her, but saw her as one in need of living water, eternal life, salvation, and she became a believer in Jesus Christ. When Jesus met Nicodemus, Nicodemus was a man of high authority, position, status, well respected, and when Jesus talked to him, as recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 3, Jesus told this man of stature, this man of wealth, this man of position, you've got to be born again like everybody else. There was no prejudice on Jesus' part, no partiality, no favoritism shown to this man just because of his status. He had to be saved like everybody else by being born again. And he was born again. Because Jesus is not prejudiced, he would meet people wherever they were, whoever they were, and talk to them about the need to become a child of God. He was not a prejudiced man. Even the enemies of Jesus recognized this. And I want you to see an interesting passage in Mark's gospel, the gospel of Mark, chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. In Mark chapter 12, look with me if you would at verse 13, Mark 12, beginning at verse 13. And Mark 12, 13, later they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words, to try to trick him into saying something that would put him in dilemma. They came to him and said, teacher, we know you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. In other words, his own enemies who were seeking to trick him and trap him recognized that Jesus treated everyone without prejudice and without favoritism and without partiality. So James comes then to verse 2 and 3 in James chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, to give an illustration. And notice this illustration beginning in verse 2 of James 2. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or you sit on the floor by my feet. The story is about Mr. Goldfinger and Mr. Tattered Bridges. They both come into the church and the usher sees the gold rings. I started out to wear my gold ring today. <laughs> the gold ring on our finger, on his finger, and he had a gem on every joint and he had designer clothes and the usher's eyes got big when he saw that and said, Mr. Goldfinger, we have a special place for you. Now, Mr. Tattered Britches, you sit over in the corner or you sit on the floor. James says that is showing partiality. It is showing prejudice. You are not living by the royal law of love. When you put people in a status and treat them by their status, instead of treating everyone the same. And notice beginning at verse 4. In verse 4, Have you not discriminated among yourselves 
and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? There was a man who was director of evangelism for Arkansas Baptist. His name was Jesse Reed. When Reed would be asked to go and supply for a pastor who had to be out on a Sunday to preach in a church, he often would put on old shabby coat and an old hat, sometimes even a beard, and would arrive at the church early. He would sit out on the steps when people were coming. And he said that some people would smile at him and acknowledge him. Some people would cast their eye his way and then move on and move away from him. He even had some church people to ask him to leave. Can you imagine how surprised they were <laughs> when the announcement came, here is our supply preacher for this morning, and he comes to the pulpit and takes off that tattered coat and hat and beard and preaches the sermon. The Bible teaches us, and this is a difficult sermon, as I guess you can tell today. It is difficult to say these things, but it's the royal law of love. It's the law of the king. And he says, you as a believer cannot be prejudiced. You cannot have prejudice in your heart because Jesus Christ when he died on the cross, died for everyone, whoever they are, rich or poor, black, white, brown, yellow, red, whoever they are, the ground around the cross is level. Amen. We all stand the same before the Lord Jesus Christ who died for all of us. We cannot harbor prejudice or favoritism in our heart as a believer. We cannot look down upon people because of who they are or their status in our church or in our Christian lives. We need to obey the royal law of love. Because prejudice is a sin that will be judged. I want you to look at James 2 again. This time, verse 9. In verse 9, it says, But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law of lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you've become a lawbreaker. Partiality, looking down upon people, showing favoritism upon people, or prejudice in your heart toward others is a sin that will be judged. And it is difficult to read what James says, and if you would, look at verses 12 and 13 of that same passage. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. 
because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. We're going to be judged without mercy. Whoa, I don't want to be in that spot. Judged without mercy. There was a man who was looked down upon in his community and he came to church one day believing he needed to be a part of a church. He talked to the pastor and asked about joining the church. The pastor, knowing this man's status, told him to go home and pray about it for two weeks before he would give him an answer. The man did not return after two weeks. But the pastor ran into the man one day at the grocery store. And he said to the man, when you came and asked about joining our church, I asked you to go home and pray about it for two weeks and you never came back. You must have gotten an answer. The man said, yes, I did. Said the Lord told me he'd been trying to get into that church for years. <laughs> and I'm not going to join a church where the Lord doesn't attend. Prejudice is a sin that will be judged without mercy. And I want you to see Jesus' comments in the book of Matthew, chapter 7. Matthew, chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Matthew 7, verse 1. In Matthew 7, 1, all of this is in red, so you know it's the words of our Lord. Matthew 7, 1, do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Prejudice is a violation of the royal law of love. And one other quick word, the royal law of love can overcome prejudice. And I want you to see verse 8 again. If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. When you receive mercy, you then learn to be merciful. I want to tell you today, I grew up prejudiced. My parents didn't teach me to be prejudiced. It was just the culture of my day all around me. And I adopted the culture of prejudice. And I lived with that prejudice and I had some encounters with others that I was prejudiced against. And it was only as a teenager that I came to understand I was lost. I needed forgiveness. I needed salvation. And I invited Jesus Christ to come into my life. And when he came into my life, he brought his mercy with him. And that mercy forgave me of my prejudice. When he came into my life, he brought with him his love. 
and His power to forgive. And He taught me this royal law of love that I'm not to show prejudice or favoritism or partiality or I'm not to look down upon other people because of who they are, what they are, or what their status of life. I'm to show mercy like I was shown mercy. I was to show love like I was shown love. And I admit to you today there have been times when that old man has popped his head up sometimes and I've had to recall the royal law of love in my attitudes and in my relationships with people. But the Lord by His mercy forgave me and by His mercy I too am to forgive and deal with others. The song says, mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. And when I began to put that into practice in my life, the Lord overcame in me a prejudice that I had carried for years. One last story. Bob Considine, a newspaper writer and TV commentator tells about a couple named Kurt and Edith. They had been married for about 20 years. They had no children. Kurt's company sent him on a special assignment to Okinawa. Edith did not get to go. Kurt was faithful to write letters regularly to Edith. And then the letters began to taper off. And then one day she received a letter with Kurt saying that he was divorcing her and marrying a 19-year-old housekeeper there in Okinawa. A year or so later, she received a letter saying that a daughter had been born to Kurt and his young bride. And sometime later, a second daughter was born. And then Edith received a letter from Kurt that said, I'm dying, and I'm going to ask if you would to take these two little girls into our home so they can grow up in America. Edith took the girls into her home. Edith began to pray that she would do the right thing and she sent a letter to this young bride and said, you must be lonely for your two girls. I invite you as well to come and live with us. When the young bride got off the plane, Edith said, I pray, Lord, help me to show the royal law of love to her. She wrote a letter to Considine, and that's how the story came to be known. She said in the letter, as I saw her get off the plane, I thought she's the one who robbed me of the love of my life. But now, living by this royal law of love, God has given me three people to love. You say, Pastor, that's not realistic. You can't do that. 
What does James say? To live by the royal law of love your neighbor as yourself is to do the right thing. The question that comes to you and to me today is simply this. Are you living by the royal law of love? Is it a part of who you are based on the love that the Lord has for you and for me? Based on the mercy that He has shown to you and to me? We are to love our neighbor, show the love and show the mercy that has been shown to us. Hear ye, hear ye, citizens of the kingdom of God. This is a decree from the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's pray. Our Father, your word is tough. It's difficult sometimes, but we know that it's always right. And we know what your law says and what your word says and what your decrees are, they're always right. And tough as they are for us sometimes to accept or to live by, it's only right, the Bible says, to live by the royal law of love. And I pray today, Lord, that all of us are living by that law and that the love that you brought with you when you came into our hearts, Lord, is the love that we're living by. And that we're obeying your commands to love God and to love each other. God, fill us with love. Forgive us when we look down upon others or show prejudice or show partiality or show favoritism. For you love everyone and we as the citizens of the kingdom are to love as you love. And I pray, Lord, if there's someone here today that has not accepted you as Lord in their lives, that today would be the day when they would say yes. Come forward and make that public. For others who come, just kneel at this altar for a moment and just have a personal word with you. And for those who would come in rededication or to come to unite with this wonderful family of faith, your will be done. Lord, as we walk out of here today, may we walk out with a determination that we have heard the decree of the Lord, the King of Kings, and we're going to live by the royal law of love. In the name of Jesus, I pray.